Marcy Dilla, oh, and Ken Jones, wherever he is. I thought he might be here. England. Uh, England. Well, he's physically in England, but he could well be dropping in on us, couldn't he? It's two o'clock in the morning. So what? That's good time. <laughs> That's poetry time. <laughs> That's your witching hour, right, Doug? <laughs> you got it. Um, yeah. Okay. So anyway, my pleasure, by the way, to share with you folks, uh, most of which I see in, in your little boxes. Um, I'm just going to uh, carry on here uh, and uh, have my little, little, little watch. So uh, I'll start with this um, poem I wrote for my wife some few years ago called The Tantric Orchard. I am so lucky to have found this orchard with you in it. Under the soil, our roots embrace like small animals driven underground. The twisted branches of the apple trees reach back to touch their thighs. Such springtime muscles shot off this green cannonball of earth. Lie on the wet grass with me. Like fruit, we swell and rub against each other. Kiss like raindrops in the milky sunlight. Grasping roots inside you, I will transplant them in a shrine, alive with wet, green, dripping things that shake themselves awake. And I will visit you with blue lakes and reckless hills, and we will watch the big white summer birds fly by like abandoned opportunities searching for their season. Around us, black grappling branches orchestrate the air, which parts and endlessly parts again. The whole orchard ripples in a soft green chord where the land ends and the feelings begin. <laughs> you heard that before, didn't you, Marcia? So, um, and kind of continuing the agricultural theme, uh, this is called the Vineyards of Fresno. A uh, city boy, but I like, you know, when I go out and see a big agribusiness, it's interesting. So this is called the Vineyards of Fresno. It's a harbor in this green world, my metal folding chair on the edge of the scraped earth. The shadow cast down by the mulberry tree, all crazy with moving leaves, shelters me as I skip my thoughts like flat rocks over incoming green legions of vines. The old man who owned these vineyards died two months ago. Suddenly, his soul hissed off from this hot earth. His niece, the lawyer from the big city, is here to search the sullen oceans of papers on the floor. Papers angry at being disturbed. The old man just walked over them. There is the sun, and there's the way out, he must have said, as he clambered over the hills of bills and invoices cluttered on the dark floors, strangle weeds of farm business underfoot. And now he reaches the door, and now holding on to the light, he enters the laughing green circuits, circus of vines. It was interesting that they had the thousands and thousands of pounds of grapes and they went right down the street to Sunkissed Raisin Company. No wineries up there. Um, <clears throat> so a little shift here. Um, I'm kind of a, if I can self-describe, it's uh, my feature here. I'm an old time rock and roll type of guy. And uh, I have a tiny cred, which is that I'm born on the same day in the same year as Keith Richard, and I went to Woodstock 1969 in New York. So this one here, <laughs> this one, and I was just working, I went up there. So this is called the Guitar Spangled Banner, Woodstock 1969. Now let us speak of the death of rock stars. Sid Vicious paid for his myth. Jim Morrison posed for his. Brian Jones turned himself into a pillar of stiff water. Jimi Hendrix was just too hot to live. I felt inside my chest to see if anything was still there. Or maybe I left it at Woodstock and why 
1969 when life overflowed the cup from surface tension and yet didn't spill. Oh, how reality smoked at half-mast when Hendrix played the star-spangled banner with notes so strung out you could hang flags off them. While the sun rose like a nuclear guitar and his heart broke into edible confetti for us conquering heroes of the new world dawning that would be, that could never be, that we could never come back from in spite of what all the bitter people who tried to come back later said. And in the middle of his single moon man guitar solo, I heard cannons of welcome, welcome booming for the new king of the hollow earth. Surreal I am, oh my God. <laughs> Actually, in whatever tidbits I've read, they say one word is quirky. And the other one is surreal, so. Oh, this is a found poem. I was thinking music stuff. And a found poem for all of us here, poets here know what it is, but I saw an ad in the, I think late 70s in Vermont somewhere. Punk band forming, 10 o'clock in high school odd. Bring your guitars. Best thing in your puny life. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it is interesting, like everybody's muted, right? Like I'm sort of, oh, I wonder if anybody laugh or no. Well, <laughs> maybe they did. <laughs> anyway, uh, that uh, uh, leads to uh, whatever. Uh, this one I wrote from a prompt. And um, so the prompt was like, as opposed to the reality, like something. So this is called Like a Hollywood Lawyer. Poetry does not require cash. Life and movies require cash. Walter required a lawyer. I required cash and threw, him some, threw in some poetry to boot. Walter, an old time indie movie producer, a phone in each ear guy, talked twisty as a Mobius stripper, made deals in a whisper. I, as lawyer, a casual bottom feeder, not tough, but easy. Enjoyed Walter, his hair slick, just back from con. Walter, an anaconda, was too fat to get in my Mini Cooper, but took movies to con, the big topless international film festival, and sold them on a burnished yacht deck under big bright breasts of sun. Distribution followed. Burp. We sat in the rented Laurel Canyon pool house office at the end of the sculpted blue swimming pool where stars once swam breaststroke and Walter and I now contemplate astronomical sails. People sued, but that was expected, even among the good guys. However, and included but not limited to, no trademark, patent, or copyright infringement could catch our legal moonwalk. I watched as clients entered the pool house stage left. There was a heave in the gable structure as they were consumed. Out came Walter, brimming with contracts I had copied from genius form books. Relieved smiles by the swimming pool and odes to the four-cornered prose I had composed all about roll about tax years, roll over tax years, trigger that loan and Who's exposed? If you ever see the phrase, kindly be advised, get out of town. On the blue blooming skyway over Hollywood, an eviction notice pinned to the first cloud. You forgot to pay on time. Who owns this dream? All right, I, I count on you, Marsha. I count on you. <laughs> Um, this is called Silver. I see its starry swath trail off in the air as I polish knives and spoons. Years ago, I polished kitchen silver with a Tibetan Lama Rinpoche who spit 
and rubbed and showed me the magic sparks that fly from the ends of forks and knives. And then he whispered, and do you know what is the most beautiful thing in the world? He smiled like a jade gate. It is the woman. Hmm. I was both stunned and pleased and thought that he was either a really wise man or a very good comedian. And I've carried the buried ax handle of this knowledge until tonight as I watch you take off your clothes and gusts of night metal fly off your body. You turn and the silver trap inside me snaps shut at the core. Um, thank you. <laughs> so um, I'm going to do, I have a, a small larger poem, which I, I wouldn't dare read it one of your readings, Phil, because it's a little bit of a, whatever, long ode. <clears throat> and I did read it there. But it's a, a, on a prompt, I wrote a poem about something. I wrote a poem about climate change. I think we're all familiar. We remember that from before the current thing and all that. So um, just kidding, but you know. So this, I wrote a poem on the prompt just about it and uh, how we are. And so, uh, this is called Apology to Greta Thunberg, Thunberg. And I think we all know who she is, right? And how about that climate change? You're right, kid. We spent it. We drove it. We burned it. We fueled it. We bought it. We rode it. But we didn't pay for it. Didn't know it was your future, too. We are your distinguished elders and came of age just before the peak of the wave. And we've surfed it to the shore, rolling in like pearls. We're the coolest. We didn't even work for it. It just got laid on us by the li big living earth Gaia. Yes, she said, take my breast. And we took her blood, skin, and bones too. And our generation has enjoyed every possibility of living whatever we want, wherever we choose to go. We're the party of freedom, meaning we partied with freedom. Now we're those hard boiled eggs in the sunset. What do you want from us? Please deliver your rage to our chattering class. We are the all the human tribe. And we welcome you, Greta, to this fat ball planet where we're all born out of God's word. And when we get hungry, we go out on the crinkle, bulgy landscape and kill, kill, kill a big elephant to feed our tribe. Lots of meat, meat, meat. We eat, eat, eat. Then dance, pray, fuck. Then pray, fuck, dance. Afterwards, sleepity sleep. Then get up, have coffee, and make civilization. Hammocks, clay pots, sexy figurines of gods, Broadway plays. We create a world of light and dark, sex, poetry, ocean-going plastic, capitalism, terrorism, a house fantastic for us alone. Enough. We hungry again. Let's get another elephant, or at least an In-N-Out burger. There's always more food, isn't there? It'll all work out somehow. There will be a solution somehow. But somehow, all that gets fuzzy when I try to think about it, I can't shoot the hoof of what to do. You say the only way is massive political action. No oil and we don't need eat anything in plastic. Not a chance unless and even if everyone else does it. The earth is so stressed digesting us, where can it shit except on you? So sorry, but didn't know. And now you know, but what to do? Also, there is no individual guilt. We're all absolved and complicit. All I ever did was drive my car and turn on the house lights and some air con. Me, such a tiny, ordinary electrical consumer. In case the planet might shrug us off, you might consider the intrinsic death wish of the species. And all that plastic in the guts of whales, we share the gifts. 
Climate change is a spiritual vaccination for those of us on the edge of the afterlife. The seas will rise, the continents fall. I thought I'd never live to see it happen, but I was wrong. Thanks. So, um, So this is what uh, the poem that uh, <coughs> Phil was generous enough, to, generous enough to print in the notice for this, called the werewolves. <clears throat> Do the werewolves belong the space between ghosts and night of eggplant dark? The moon itself, a wandering soul, peers through treetops at my heart, a deer frozen in a forest of eyes, lupine and shaped like leaves. I know they are near. I see them when they blot out the moon, hear them when they call my name. Summoning them is an entertainment at my own expense. They lope alongside me, and when I look at them, their eyes get bigger. I treat them now as my children, feed them everything I have. They all live with me, and at night, I draw these friends around me like a fur coat and look up at the moon awash in darkness and the hunger that comes out of me is a long wail in the night. You know, I've been looking for happy endings for a long time. I'm hoping to have one for this particular individual, but I don't know if literature, literature suits. Um, so how are we doing? Okay, I'll do a couple more. Um, This is a, I'll do two more. And this is a uh, foreign travel. And I lived for a year in Brazil. And I used to go to some of the, uh, in the Spanish word is Santeria, but some of the, uh, the native religions, which are mostly uh, founded in Africa, but they have a, a Catholic veneer because they had to coexist with the church in, in uh, colonial Brazil. So this is called Lesson in Conversational Portuguese, to be translated. And uh, what else? I think it explains itself. And the particular mystical group in this one is called Umbanda. Lesson in conversational Portuguese. After a prayer meeting with the spurting of chicken blood in the dusty and livid interior of Brazil, the father of the saints, Pai dos Santos, who had killed the chicken earlier that afternoon, took a liking to me. Você tem o preconceito místico? Are you of the mystical persuasion? Tenho sim, I said. Sure, of course. Dude. Então, eu só faço bem. I just do good, he said, in a juicy Morse code flicker of offering that raced over my heart like a fleet of gazelles. Mas se você quiser mal, but if you want the bad stuff, I know someone who can help. I declined with some regret at opportunity lost in the quick tropical sunset reversed and flat like a bed sheet, but I had respect for this father of Umbanda like the toad has for the wheel. Você tem o preconceito místico on the chair, my hands shook like bamboo. Of course, I've seen the fountains go out in someone's eyes in the struggle under the skin I negotiate with the runaway heart all the time. In Brazil, I got into a big taxi cab and got the hell out of there. When I got far away, I felt backwards behind me and he was still there, a faint lamp on a dark street and in my wallet was a fresh card that did not exist. It said, eu só faço bem, I just do good. Stay away from them witch doctors. <laughs> I didn't, no, I didn't stay away from them. Um, <clears throat> so this is my last poem and it's just another fun poem as I kind of have fun. And um, it's a, uh, I spent some time in New York doing a thing, a show about five years ago. <clears throat> and I used to take the E train and uh, as, well, this is a poem humbly about the New York subway, okay? So, which is a big deal if you're there. So uh, I used to take this train, which 
crosses town, so that saves a lot of other trains, okay? So enough of that. My mother, the E train. Attention sucked by sharp, bright light. People clench butt muscles, rip bags, turn up track like meerkats for the familiar stranger with the roar that jiggles flesh. Stand up for the E train. Stand up for the might of door. This sandworm with the same steel mouth at both ends can eat through formerly secure Manhattan Island granite with the speed of pornography. Up there on Fifth Avenue, there's concrete and hypocrisy, plus delight in shop windows. The real weight of all that concrete is both finite and infinite. Rich people are holding up banks. People walk with umbrellas pitched against cloud and rain. Water towers stagger on roofs. We're just a wriggle in the terrarium, reeling around the west side. My buttocks slam against the wall, and I celebrate humility, efficiency, electricity, survival, and abuse, and in this car enjoy the migration of other urban creatures, namely the decrepit, the one-legged, the wool-capped, the glamorous, the highly pressed, who have sex inside their suits, upriver in the spawning grounds or downtown towards the sea of birth. That girl looks thoughtful between earphones like teardrops. She's gonna eat her phone. I wanna see her mouth open silver and red and the metal stop talking. Stand up for Spring Street. What spring is that? Expulsion into cold, dull day. Tourniquet of noon. Threading pedestrians, I walk fast as a winter riddle, but it's only for lunch with a friend. A pasta restaurant with floppy noodles in an all night, all eyes city, which is in itself a restless hunter. And I got here invisibly because nobody who saw me, saw me. Thank you very much. <laughs>